donut of course predominantly by harvest plus okay next please so for the benefit of uh, a group i organized the presentation in a way that what's the rationale behind this exercise so why we are doing sorghum biofortification and where are we actually or uh, before we start and what are the targets we are trying to reach and what kind of variability is present for this site in the in the various materials we have and what strategic research we attempted to uh, understand the genetics of this site its association with so that we can really improve this and also where we are today uh, and what we want to do in the next few years to reach our targets so that's what in brief uh, i'm going to talk to you in the maybe next 30 35 minutes next please okay some of you might have come across this um, there was a big exercise in copenhagen almost a year ago uh, with the world renowned economists just here note their economists not any breeder so they have been invited and deliberate on the contemporary global challenges uh, ranging from a very big range of things like armed conflicts natural disasters health education agriculture climate change so on and so forth so after intense deliberations they have been asked to identify the most important or compelling thing which the world should immediately react and invest to address them so they have listed because they have been given a choice of 75 billion us dollars amount so they have to allocate and they have identified 16 important areas i listed only 6 here and the first top most intervention they Uh, pointed out was micronutrient intervention that is the fundamental to address at this point in time at a global level and many others that are basically falling in the health sector and you can see on the sixth place is research in uh, agriculture basically for grain yield your climate change agro biodiversity uh, addressing all those kinds of concerns so that's the importance of nutrition next please and we know of course uh, uh nutrition is an issue but there are ways and means to tackle this basically the best way is food diversification followed by there are countries where even supplementation is required there are countries where fortification is regularly done and biofortification of course i miss to tell you for those of you who are new to biofortification it basically is a means of enhancing grain mineral nutrient content by genetic means either grain or any plant part for this matter if you are increasing by genetic means that is termed as biofortification it's relatively a new term in terms of scientific cycles maybe it is introduced in the last 10 years let's say so so there is no single method that really address the bio uh, means uh, nutrition malnutrition issue so a combination of all these required and if you see the global statistics almost there is a 7 billion population and around 1 billion population is really poor who have very less incomes maybe a dollar or 1.5 25 dollars a day but if you see the malnutrition statistics it's very very disturbing rather almost 60% of the population particularly in the developing countries is uh, iron deficient almost more than 30% is zinc deficient these two are we all know fundamental they are very fundamental for all our metabolic reactions many enzymes pathways in so that's where the, uh, the this part here but so biofortification in a way is not a silver bullet to solve the malnutrition but it really complements well the various efforts of uh, to address the malnutrition next please. just did you ever imagine uh, what are the top 10 crops that feed the world today or in the last maybe thousands of years so i just do in doubt actually to know a couple of times there are no prizes for those uh, who guess top 3 almost everybody in the house knows it next please yes up to corn wheat rice potato cassava soybeans and sweet potatoes and of course hams and plantains so can anyone guess what is number 8 huh okay you are right we will get extra coffee after this uh, so this is one mandate crop of the three set which is the top 10 crops that feed the world okay so when we are doing sorghum biofortification so the beauty is that we are dealing with a very pertinent issue in the world the same time in a very important crop 
So when you combine those, it is really going to help for the very noble cause. Next. So to be more specific now, sorghum is a staple food, we all know. It's almost half a billion population spanning over 30 countries or even more in Africa and Asia. And of course, if you see at a country level, for example, take India, the per capita consumption may be 5 kg per year. But if you see the predominantly those who really consume sorghum, there it is more than 75 kg per hectare. So that's the importance of it, its food value. And if you have to supply a person, whether it is uh, energy or, meat or protein or iron and zinc, it will be very cheaper to give him, pro, give him or her throw sorghum or millet compared to any other animal food or any other food in terms of economics I am talking. And also this particular crop contributes particularly the poor people where uh, you cannot really afford to high value food, they depend more on sorghum for 50 or more than 50 percent of their micronutrient requirement in a day. So while sorghum means that is rainy season sorghum being consumed across the world, uh, in, in specific case like India, the post rainy sorghum is predominantly uh, uh, consumed for food. Next slide. Just to give a brief uh, uh, introduction to the structure of sorghum, as you know of course broadly sorghum grain has three important parts, the outer pericarp, the testa, endosperm and embryo, like any other cereal grain. And it is this place, a layer, layer, where most of the proteins and mineral nutrients are, are located and also partly in the endosperm and, to, and also good to a good extent in case of embryo. But embryo is a very small proportion so we don't get much from embryo. But the good thing is in this crop is across the globe if you see how sorghum is consumed maybe in the form of uh, let us say stove or ugali or injera or for that matter roti, this aluminum layer is intact in their food preparation. So the, when we really increase iron and zinc, that will be consumed by the people. So that's a good point I want to tell you here. And when we tell about sorghum, like across the world actually, people will have good number of apprehensions actually. So before the seminar, after the talk, many people will ask you, is it not that sorghum is uh, not digested uh, properly? Is it not that it has lot of high tech content? Is it not that it has excellent or it has blah 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 character? that will really reduce its food value, so those kind of things. But to be really look into very uh, scientifically what is the kind of uh, uh, nature sorghum grain has as far as its uh, nutritional content is concerned. The white grain sorghum which are predominantly consumed across the world, almost 99 percent they do not have any tannins. Tannins are nothing but polyphenols. Okay, they are present in all sorghums but in a very limited quantities which does not really interfere. But in some sorghums, particularly the brown sorghums, where which have a very pigmented testa, they have condensed tannins, which really interfere with proteins and also minerals. That will really uh, uh, reduce the bioavailability. But not they are very very limited things. Next thing is, in fact, this tannins actually the so-called. Uh, uh, highly condensed tannins are now being used as functional foods. For example, diet coke, you will enjoy the coke but you won't get any energy. So you, that's the beauty. So it's a functional food. You can really have the taste and everything but that will not increase your value or uh, uh, nutritional uh, energy or fat content. Next thing is yes, sorghum has phytates like again in many other crops it do have and bioavailability of legume or cereal based diet if you look at, the iron bioavailability is just 5 percent and of course for zinc it is 25. Of course you know for animal foods it is very very high, could be even 100 percent. But in spite of this, there are certain compounds which will really enhance the bioavailability of iron and zinc. Any, any diet for that matter if you take, but with the help of ascorbic acid and also in the presence of beta carotene and compounds like inulin. So many of the times people will apply actually they use lemon actually, they drink lemon before taking lunch or dinner. So that, that's a good trend actually, that's good, we should encourage that because that will particularly in the plant based food that will enhance the bioavailability of the nutrients. 
One of the biggest things actually where we have a good advantage is sorghum is gluten free. Whereas all other uh, products, uh, all other crops like wheat, for example, and its cousins like barley or rye or pelta, they all have gluten. And there are people actually, millions of people, particularly in the North America and Europe, they have a celiac disease. They, they are allergic to the gluten protein. So this is the best bet for those kind of people and also the, all the preparations, whatever they make with wheat and all, that can be made by the sorghum. And now it's a big market for sorghum actually. So gluten free bread, cookies, beer, everything is marketed. So that way it has a lot of health advantage. Okay, in this backdrop, when the biofortification area is being taken at Ikrisat, so we just first started uh, looking at because uh, it is predominantly the post any cultivars. Suppose so tomorrow, if Purna Rama is sitting here, so he got a crazy idea to eat a wheat uh, roti, uh, sorry, sorghum roti, so he goes to a supermarket and he purchases a, a kg of uh, sorghum. So that will be mostly either Maldandi or Dagdi or any one of these varieties. So when he buy it, what he get? It's only around 30, that will have around the 30 ppm RNG and also around 20 ppm, uh, 30, 20 ppm zinc, sorry 30 ppm iron. So that I say is low, it's not low compared to rice or wheat or maize, but low compared to what is required for you in a day, what is recommended by WHO in terms of recommended dietary allowance. So we should have, means uh, if you look at the sorghum consumption and its retention and also bioavailability, you should have around 60 ppm iron and 40 ppm zinc. So that will be the ideal level to consume sorghum, particularly to benefit those populations who predominantly consume sorghum. Okay. So we started at that level, so 30 iron and 20 zinc and from where we are now moving to 60 iron and 40 zinc, simply doubling the base levels what we have. But one thing let me share with you, particularly uh, those students who are here, the phenotyping for iron and zinc is uh, a bit cumbersome. In a way, it's not that simply you will harvest and record. So you should be very, very uh, careful in uh, generating the material, in conducting the trials. You should never handle with any metallic containers, any of it from almost uh, growing of the crop to harvesting, pressing or even analysis. You should be very careful. It should not touch dust any time in the field or anywhere. So, utmost care should be taken. Number two, the analysis is generally by atomic absorption spectrometry or inductively coupled spectrometry. So, there is another method, new method that I will discuss with you later. But these are the more precise methods. But the fights slow, it will be time taken. So, you need to really be very patient actually. You will be harvesting the crop, but you will have the results maybe by the end of the year. So that's the kind of flow mess we have in this kind of analysis. Okay, then having said that, okay, we uh, most of our, uh, let's say, whatever is being consumed where the people have low iron and zinc, the best possibility actually to increase iron and zinc is just look at whether is there any feasibility of agronomical means to enhance the iron and zinc. So we tried actually by various means, by application of, let us say, iron containing micronutrient fertilizers, zinc containing, combination of iron and zinc, iron with boron, zinc with boron, all these kinds of combinations and permutations. Secondly, we tried with soil application, foliar application. We apply, we, we tested in various kinds of soils, black soils, red soils, on farm, on station, different kinds of materials like hybrids, varieties, hair interlines. But Unfortunately, in, in none of these cases we got any significant uh, difference in terms of iron and zinc. So, means we did not get any appreciable advantage of applying. We, we are getting yield advantages definitely. Whenever there is iron deficiency or zinc deficiency in soil, if you exogenously if you apply these things, you get a good incremental yield, but never the iron and zinc increasing. So that's the kind of limitation we uh, we are having at this moment. And it is so in, even now in other crops too, not much really good uh, incremental advantage. But efforts are still underway. We would like to also still continue this. Next please. Then we looked at um, the entire spectrum of sorghum cultivars, for example, grown in a country like India. So we, re we wrote letters to all the private sector, public sector partners, requesting them that 
what are all the relieved varieties which are in the field now which have been cultivated by the farmers you please supply to us then we we compiled we we made them trials and we we, we evaluated them for three seasons and we found that there is good variability for iron and zinc for how is okay there is a uh, good variability for iron and zinc you can see the the red one is iron um and this lemon kind of yellow is the uh, zinc there is variability but uh, none of them has the real required target because we are targeting iron 40 and zinc at 6 okay okay so but among them yes these are all high yielding but some of them do have uh some of them do have let's say because in the post training we have only uh, 30 iron but in case of these lines we have almost 44 that means 50% higher than the what is really consumed in india similarly for zinc also almost more than 50% higher than what is routinely consumed but the irony is that these hybrids are predominantly used as a feed or industrial alcohol or for some other purpose and very limited quantity really goes to food so that means nutrient rich food is going to non food users and nutrient food but considered to be good quality grain is being consumed by the people next then we started looking at even a spectra of other materials like let us say hybrid parents we have a large number of uh, hybrid parents in sorghum more than 800 ab pairs that is see dr bairam reddy here and many of his predecessors for various states of interest of course they were, never they were bred for iron and zinc but for yield or maturity or disease resistance pest resistance and so on so we found that there are at least there good number of hybrid parents which have almost up to 48 even one case we found even 50 iron 50 ppm iron content which is quite significantly high similarly when we examine more, here we have almost finished more than 523 now and in our lines again we tested more than 100 There is also good variability, but not as much as in the female parents. This is because most of the time, the research focus was on B-line development because this this is very critical in the sorghum improvement program, particularly in the hybrid development. Developing a B-line means a B-pair is much more difficult than developing a male pair. So almost entire focus was on the is also on the B-line development. So that's a lot of variability you can see for the B-line. so what we are trying to do this high iron zinc b or I means ab line female and male parents now we, we are making use them in hybrid development and evaluation so these are some of uh, some of the b lines where significantly high iron content is noted next please these are uh, sample r lines that have really high iron and zinc and then we examine the one more uh, Uh, thanks to Dr. Upadhyay and his team here. When we requested, they supplied us all the core germplasm materials they have, maybe more than 2,900 something they supplied us. And of course, some of them they did not flower in the post training season because all this evaluation will do in the, only in one season, which should be rain free so that it will be disease free. So when we examine more than 2,200 the lines, we found a good number of lines actually. which have zinc significantly higher than our target level and that's a good number of lines which show even more than 60 uh, iron content so that means so then we we could believe that okay so there is a way that by genetic means we can really enhance iron zinc in sorghum and we are we are now using them as donors in our cracking program these are all in white grain background just going to go back once so what are the go back one please yeah so all the information now we have generated over years maybe last 7 8 years particularly now we have kept them in a database and made them publicly available so anybody is interested in this uh, assessing accessing the database can really go into the net and just see if if any line is interesting to see whether whether iron and zinc uh, quantity of those lines available you can really check and use them in your program next please So a lot of focus in our program is uh, the on the material that is suitable to sub-Saharan Africa. As you know, in most, of course, in ESM, some consumption of white grain is there, but in other parts of Africa, 
it's mostly red grain and other colored grains of this water. So in those cases, back please, there also you can see in a material from a large number of countries belonging to different races showing iron content much higher than our target levels and also zinc content in some cases higher than our target levels. So, so these lines are now available and information is in public domain. So that means anybody which is really interested, who is really interested can even pick some of them which are agronomically good as seen in kind of varieties for use in Africa. Actually. Yeah, this is one interesting line actually IS23680. It is a Mozambique yes. origin and it has very high iron and zinc content. This is IS26962 is originated in India. It, it looks almost like a, actually a released variety. It is so good agronomically. So right now, in fact, we planted these two in the main gate demonstration. So two months later, actually, you can see them, uh, how they really look. Then we examined actually, okay, ha having seen that there is a good variability, then what kind of relations that these traits have with, between themselves and also with other agronomic traits. So like in other CDRs, we found a good correlation in a range of material between iron and zinc. The, con the correlation is always positive, 0.8 even sometimes 0.9. The good thing is that we did not find any negative correlation with the yield. So this gives us a kind of confidence that it is feasible to develop hybrid parents or hybrids that will have high yield also simultaneously also high iron and zinc. So there is no kind of yield penalty for, uh, for bio fortification. Then we try to understand the genetics of this site, how they are inherited. Of course it is known, uh, they are quantitatively inherited. There is a continuous variation in the population. And there are significant BCA and SCA for these two traits and predominant additive action in governing the whale zinc. Whereas for iron, both additive and non-additive are important. So that means if you, the implications for breeding is that if you want to improve for iron, there is some scope for heterosis breeding. But if you want to improve for zinc, you need to have both the parents with high iron. There is no scope for heterosis, but you need to improve both the parents. But in a breeding program, we always target both iron and zinc. So that means you should have both parents rich in iron and zinc. So that is a prerequisite to develop a good hybrid. Next please. Yes, this is a snapshot of what kind of material uh, we have in the uh, hand right now. So in the last five years, maybe we have done more than 1200 grasses using all those superior uh, donor parents for, uh, for producing transversal segregate. And also we made more than 670 hybrids also. Whenever we identify the parental lines with high iron zinc, then immediately we make a hybrid combination and see. The idea is that this hybrid should go as early as possible into the commercial cycle so that we can, we will always have a pi pipeline of material available for dissemination. Similarly, there are a range of uh, I mean, segregating generations available wherein we are trying to uh, uh, increase iron and zinc by uh, pumping new donors into the cluster program. Okay, uh, sorghum is a smart crop, generally it is mentioned in Ikrisa most of the time, not only because of its uh, multiple uses, but also it has many other advantages. For example, sorghum is similar to its closely linked crop like let's say closely related crop like maize, for most ways, but it is very smart in a way, it, its genome size is just one fourth of maize, so that is the beauty, so the way it is organized is very intelligent. So, in case of sorghum, like in other crops, the sorghum sequence is available. It has been sequenced in 2009. And large number of SSR and even now SNPs are also available um, by GBS. Everything, means all the platforms are really being working in sorghum. QTLs have been identified for a large number of traits, for a range actually, for biotic, abiotic kinds of traits. And also, all these QTLs have been also mapped actually in silico onto a single map so that you will, you can see a picture of QTLs for various traits in one map and then you can use in the breeding program. And for iron and zinc what we did is courtesy uh, Santosh and of course Tom has to some extent. So we, uh, we have a breeding, uh, we have a RIL population uh, in Ikrisat developed for a different trait but 
to have good variable, the parent alliance having excellent variability for iron and zinc, the diversity. So we use, uh, we are using actually rather that RIL population, I think around 300 RIL in that population. Right now we are phenotyping them in three locations in Patansharu, Parbani and in, uh, in DSR. And of course uh, the crop is harvested and very soon we will be uh, doing the phenotyping. And of course genotyping just we started now. So this is one method of uh, a kind, it is not a real high throughput what you use in the molecular breeding terms, but uh, it is a very rapid uh, phenotyping method for assessing iron and zinc. This is a small machine attached to a computer. You will have a kind of plate here. There will be 10 uh, small plates in that you will put the seed and you insert and close it. The x-rays will pass through it and, uh, and you will have a a graph ready, I mean, a chart table ready with what, what, um, tree, I mean, what seed sample you are inserted and how much iron there and zinc there. So that's the kind of, within 10, 15 minutes, you, uh, every time you get this kind of uh, data. So you, in a way you can uh, get in a day maybe more than 300 samples. That's the uh, rapidness we have. But the thing is, uh, one, another advantage is that then the sample will not be distracted. You can reuse this in your breeding program. And we, the big point is that we compare this, means the data obtained from this uh, technique with the data from the lab, that means AS or uh, inductively coupled method, ICP method. With good correspondence, for zinc almost 90%, there is 0.9% correlation between lab data and also experiment data. Similarly for iron up to 0.8. But the thing is, to be more precise, it is, we still bank upon the lab data because so that is more precise. This sometimes will be a little bit variable. So what we are trying to do is to use this in discarding the large number of progenies actually. You have 1000 lines, the best way is use subjected to XRF. Discard those with less than 40-45 ppm for iron, maybe less than 30 ppm for zinc straight away. And those you really with substantial things, then you go to the lab and confirm that. So that's the kind of approach we are taking. So now uh, with this effort, just to summarize now where we have reached. So we started with uh, 30 ppm for iron and moving with a target of 60. So in the hybrids, there are up to 45 now. Also in the parental lines, we almost reached 50. But in germplasm, there is good scope. More than 70, couple of lines, not one actually. Similarly for zinc, started with 20 ppm, we are moving with a target of 40, so more than 30 in uh, some of these lines, particularly in uh, indigenous kind of lines, also in some hybrid parents, but there are actually n number of germplasm who have more than 40. So having uh, come to this, then what we are looking uh, to do is, whatever the best thing we have in hand right now, we want to push it immediately to the farmers so that we can really start addressing the issue and people will be really acquainted with cultivation of biofortified crops. Then top of the targeted deficit, because we are targeting maybe 60 iron, we have around 50 ppm iron, maybe try to bridge that using maybe agronomic biofortification, so those kind of options we are looking at. Of course continue making incremental increase, so that is the very purpose of breeding program, so we try to use the new parent and new donors into the crossing program and try to identify the segregants that have not only agronomically good but also high iron zinc. Similarly, nutrient bioavailability, of course we per se do not have the capabilities uh, to do this but we are partnering with now, of course little bit partnership we do have with MIN but we want to further enhance this so that actually if bioavailability, if it is presently 5% for iron, if you make it, if you make it six percent, our targets can be even reduced. If it is seven percent, probably we don't need to increase. Whatever we have will be fine. So similarly, of course, identification of QTLs that is ongoing, and we will try to deploy in the next two to three years, and eventually to increase the stakeholders' capacity, particularly the NARS programs and our colleagues, which who are not really willing to take up this as a trade before, actually. So they were, they were of the opinion that nobody is going to take uh, biofortified uh, cultivars right now. But now slowly the realization is coming. So everywhere now 
trying they are trying to initiate new breeding programs specifically for biofortifying this organ so that's and some of them are collaborating with other now next please yeah so then um, one of the last things uh, which we need to really stress is uh, enhancing the outreach so having a product is one thing Go going up to that stage is one point but going beyond is much more difficult actually but fortunately we have developed a strong delivery pipeline particularly in the hope project phase one you can see our uh, results some of you this has come up even in the cg stories the kind of uh, uh, particularly in uh, asia and other parts of uh, other parts of africa how much really difference it made how we pumped the cultivars into the cultivation so those kind of uh, networking already done there is already a good variety pvk a201 it's almost everywhere we grow in the demonstration also so this is a very high yielding variety but also has very high iron zinc of course by chance we did not really breed for that we have bred basically for grain mold resistance and right now it is already there in 100000 hectares in maharashtra state so we want to elevate this further so that this kind of cultivars will be more and more popular with the farmers of course working with nas and other partners we will still enhance it but one good news is that even governments are try, are realizing the importance of biofortification because malnutrition is one thing people are nowadays consider any policy maker that they consider it as a stigma to their country or their uh, state or whatsoever so so that way actually even openly they are allocating the budget to disseminate the biofortified cultivars to the farmers so recently almost 36 million dollars is being allocated for this year alone in india to uh, disseminate this cultivar so we are already in maharashtra is one of those states and we already have links with them in the insin program and hope program and all so we will be actually even working in this area also so that way the pipeline is ready the products are coming up so whenever these are when we are making an incremental gain can be immediately commercialized this is one way and of course hprc is already there with us that is another way of uh, of passing our material to the farmer okay so it's not a one man show actually so there are a good number there are great number of people who are some of them are in this uh, audience uh, who contributed to this work let me really name them and thank them actually it's my privilege Uh, Dr. Bairam Reddy, in fact, he started this work, uh, and he will surely pass it to me. Of course, Dr. Fred Rattinde, based in WCA, he works with me in this project basically, and Dr. Tom and Santosh, particularly the CTL part, they are helping us, and my colleagues Ramaya and recently joined Anuradha, helping me in the day-to-day -day activities. And these are the new partners actually, MAU. DSR and to some extent MPKV also we conduct multi location trial there. So they they are really uh, slowly opening up their breeding programs and now explicitly working on bio fertilization. So Harvest Plus was the only donor for so many years, but now DBT is also interested and they are pumping. And right now uh, bio fertilization, the commercialization part is mostly uh, it is it falls in the CRP4 that is uh, agriculture for nutrition. that uh, domain but breeding part and all that we it will be in the dialing so that's how this is organized and that's where we reached from it from a modest beginning i think we are through thank you so and i'll be happy to address uh, 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 sorry i need to mention some more people actually uh, people like dr shahrawat uh, whom always i bother uh, with all my uh, doubts and also for analysis part uh, dr pardu sarde rao uh, all this economic analysis and how important really it is how to focus and all so some of these people and dr upadhyay and group they supply the material and many others if i miss uh, they help us in in this program thank you very much Yeah, thank you very much for excellent uh, presentation and uh, keeping us awake for 45 minutes. And um, one thing we all always like uh, nutritious food. Iron and zinc are important for human beings. Whenever we increase iron and zinc, my insects also like iron and zinc. And uh, is there any relation you have seen uh, susceptibility of these lines to insect pests? 
because in Andhra Pradesh now, Rabi sorghum is picking up and some farmers I have seen they are uh, harvesting up to 6 tons per hectare, excellent and they are making good profit. But they put uh, 5 to 6 sprays to control insects, mm -hmm. plus they dump carbide in every wall. Uh, so can you please tell us the any relationship, uh, yeah. the, the way you increase the nutrition, the most of this, they become susceptible to insect pests. Yeah, of course. We, uh, at least so far we did not notice any uh, difference between uh, let's say grain cultivars and biofortified cultivars as far as insect resistance is concerned. But that would be interesting to see in future. Yes? Uh, it's Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe now you have to change it. <laughs> Yeah, of course, uh, 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 some of, uh, uh, to address some of your concerns. First thing is like, um, uh, sorghum or biofortification is no more curry for rabbi specific. So we, we almost forgot it. Now it's open. So it's across, cuts across regions, seasons and all that. So it's everywhere we live for. Second thing is, yeah, as you said, um, I, I am also of the same opinion that uh, I won't advocate, um, let's say, if there is a malnutrition, you consume only biofortified crops. No. You introduce it, but couple it with other things. So the first point, if, I, if you remember, I showed food diversification. That is fundamental. That is the ultimate thing, actually. The, the, the irony is, is, actually, in most cases, people are not poor, but they are malnourished. That's the irony. That means they don't know that what to eat. So if we can give that education, that is going to, to, to a considerable extent we can reduce malnutrition. So biofortification is only for those people who neither have the money to go buy a high value food or they don't have access in their place. So they only depend upon the cereals for their diet. You know, those kind of people, it will really complement. But of course, I don't think anybody on earth is just surviving on cereal stuff. There will be, even if nothing is available, they must be eating some insects. So that is a good source. So that way I, I feel, yes, it only complements, not necessarily it's a filler bullet. But another thing is, um, what that you said, uh, economics, of course, anyway, you need to look at it, whether it is cheaper or even costlier. Maybe if you can, again, look in 2013, probably things may change. But still it may be cheaper than animal protein and all that. That's feasible. <laughs> yeah, my kid. I am seeing the highly correlated, but the mode of inheritance was different for both of them, isn't it? One was additive and the other one has, has heterosis. Yeah. Why is that if they are so highly correlated? Yeah, 
this is actually a um, kind of uh, unexpected uh, maybe result in sorghum. In most crops, we find uh, only additive gene action. But in case of sorghum, um, for iron particularly, it is predominant additive only, but there is a considerable uh, non-additive component existing there. So we, we still are looking at it, but we, we really don't have it. We'll yes. 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 Yeah. There is a, of course, uh, this is first year that we went for a multi-location testing for iron and zinc, but the varied, uh, means G into interaction, E interaction is very, very high. Means, yeah, it varies uh, between the fields across the years, but however, however, the genotypic component is having high influence on the overall expression of iron and zinc than the environment component. That means right. So that means when you are developing a cultivar, you need to really test for years and across locations to have a kind of real valid, confidently say that yes, this is everywhere it gives a very high iron. For example, we have a line called PVK801. It gives anywhere from 42 to 48, but not less than 40. So across years I am talking about. Let us say if you test for 15, 20 times, so this is the range it gives. But never always the same value, which we cannot that with it. Yes, please. At least on my experience on uh, barley and wheat on the uh, G by interaction, uh, yes, it's correct that uh, at least in those two crops uh, uh, there is uh, a G by interaction, uh, but it's not of a crossover type. And that's in a way is quite important in terms of uh, for selection uh, because uh, lines that are low are always low, but lines that are high are always high. So I don't know whether this is you have noticed the same uh, in uh, sorghum. Yeah, that is same in sorghum. Yeah, that's why PVK is not one I said. But we use it as a control in all our experiments. So it is more or less same kind of pattern. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If more iron and zinc is mobilized from the shoot to the grain, how about the fodder quality? Does how about the fodder quality? <laughs> of course, uh, uh, we uh, in sorghum at least we never examine the iron content in the other plant pots. Honestly, uh, means. Um, whether because of this uh, translocation into grain, does it really reduce the iron content in the leaves or other plant pots, or does it any way affect in the uptake by the root? Those things really we did not study as a thing. Sure. In most cases, uh, the uptake is similar but maybe there might be a difference in uh, translocation, but this has not been studied either in parlimulate or sorghum. Uh, how the, the uptake and total uptake and then, then translocation to seed preferentially, I, I think has not been studied. Of course, it will also depend on the harvest index and grain and uh, grain, zinc and uh, iron harvest index. There you are. How much of the minimum daily requirement of iron is currently met by sorghum consumption in India? Yeah, I showed in, um, let us say, in the low income, means poorest of the poor who consume sorghum, more than 50% of their, di uh, their daily requirement is coming from sorghum. And as the income increases, that will go down to 40%, in some cases maybe 30%. So that's all. Yes. Well, at least um, we did not go to that level, whether varietal difference is there or not, but could be feasible. But yeah. If you can correlate 
there is a phytate content with bio it is correlated in a way higher the phytate lower the bioavailability there is variation for phytate content in sorghum we have observed that also in other cereals in fact people have marked tutorials for iron and zinc on different chromosomes and for phytate on different chromosomes that means they are not linked so there is a possibility of variation for bioavailability also but we need to really corroborate Yeah, Dr. Ashok Kumar, there are two questions from outside, uh, most probably Dr. Central well, our alumni from Hitrisat. Mm -hmm. uh, first question is, what is the availability, the bioavailability of highest content of iron and zinc in varieties and diets? That is the first question. Second one is, what is the effect of storage time on the retention of these micronutrients? Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks, Central. Uh, first thing is, uh, as I indicated, uh, the bioavailability of iron in sorghum is 5%. Like in other cereals and pulses, that's the bottom line. Please don't think that it is low in sorghum. Low in all plant-based diets. So start eating animal proteins, please. Number two, uh, bioavailability of zinc is 25%. Again, similar in all plant-based diets. There's no difference. So bioavailability is always measured in the diet, not in the crop per se. The way you consume, that's where you need to see the bioavailability, not in the grain per se. Our plant part per se. So that part is his first question. Second one, sorry, I. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Last year only we got this idea because we know that uh, beta carotene decreases by storage. But iron and zinc, when we search it in the literature, there is no information. So right now we already we are conducting a trial actually to understand whether with storage, well, will there be any difference in iron and zinc? Only so, just to caution any type, I mean, not more time the breeder's life is so smooth. <laughs> so, in the case with breeding for high grain zinc and iron, because uh, only the phytates affect all the bioavailability, and there are uh, gen there is genetic variation among genotypes, but we need to monitor the phytate content in at least the high promising cultivars. That is one issue. And the second one, as we see here, uh, the rabi sorghum lines are cultivars by and large they have less content in the grain, iron, zinc. Whereas the ones we are, by and large, there may be exceptions, the ones we are finding to have high amounts, they have the hard grains like PV gate, not one. So there is, seems to be some correlation between hardness and the softness. These rabi sorghums are not that hard. So. And mostly rabi sorghums go for into the food chain. Mm -hmm. So when you breed uh, rabi sorghums with uh, uh, the high iron grain content uh, without uh, hardness, so the challenge is there. So just to flag the issue for future breeding. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Number one. That, that's a good point. Uh, sorry, I missed it. Uh, in fact, uh, there are certain processing techniques where there are simple household processing techniques through which we can enhance the bioavailability of foods. For example, soaking. For example, uh, fermentation, which can be done in, in any household. That will substantially enhance the bioavailability. Because when you soak, the phytose activity will be uh, increased and also at the same time the ascorbic acid content will go up so that's how the bioavailability starts building up so also in fermentation so these are certain options in fact recommended in WCA particularly by our own colleagues particularly for the young mothers and also for any children to enhance the bioavailability so that is another area of work actually one can look into so that way in fact our breeding code targets can be reduced the more you enhance, 
بجاب المدير ايدي So the focus of the identified germplasm strategy of the accessions where you have the high iron and zinc. Additional accessions from those areas may add diverse for your. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point actually. That is one area we want to look further because now having looked at so many lines, now probably we will stick to those areas where from the really the donors. Or really, how come from? So that being that we feel will have real good advantage for us in future. So those things we'll be requesting to you soon, actually. Because you ask so many questions. Right? <laughs> 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 anyway, sorry. Um, you are right actually. Uh, nobody is going to buy our product if you say that it has high iron and zinc. It has to be coupled with high yield. That's why uh, though we made 600 high yields, we did not uh, commercialize even one. Because we either have land with very high yield, but very okay normal levels of iron and zinc, or we have good iron and zinc, but yield levels are quite measurable. So unless you combine both, an agronomic desirability and iron and zinc, I think at least there is no way we can market them. So the is it Except it's only add on price. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even in case of pearl millet, for example, what is uh, now commercialized, they already have around 10 20 percent higher, uh, let's say, grain yield also coupled to yeah, 8 to 0. Okay. I agree, we see no correlation, which is a good thing to see. But but as far as I know, if we just simply bred for high iron and zinc lines, we couldn't be guaranteed that they're going to be high yielding. But we do know if we increase drought tolerance or insect resistance or disease tolerance, we can actually affect yields. Okay. And that's our problem. And that's why it's a it's a hidden trait. And it's a very hard one to know how you sell it. So you've got to couple it with with something else. You know, and yield is definitely the, the, the top three traits that most people look for. So another challenge will be actually, um, in fact, there will be a little bit color difference between a real good high yielding variety and also a bio fortified variety, particularly in case of beta carotene and to some extent even high <laughs> Then there's a real problem. Yeah, that, that education is again part of our work. Because without color, you can't get the trait also. So that's the problem. I really, we never examined. I have no idea, honestly. If you must. Yeah, of course, fermentation, soaking, we have data. But malting, I have never come across it. I don't know. But, but there are all... Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but there is gluten-free beer. Gluten-free, that's gluten-free beer I am talking about. Yeah. <laughs> 
In fact, uh, recently in the hope to uh, means that meeting in Iowa also this came into discussion. Uh, across the regions, the breeders are of the opinion that even in the shortest possible term, if even a biofortified cultivar is not ready also, at least we should take care that our high yielding products, whatever we release hereafter, should not have low iron and zinc. That thing we should not do. Even if they are really high yielding, that is not ready. So that's the kind of thinking process that has come up. There should be deliberate effort actually, not just like that. So, true, you are right. Pardon? What Means you are comparing to the. <laughs> 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 the 